morning. Today I'm speaking on the path of beauty. I'm taking as my scriptural source a passage from the Hebrew scriptures that says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We say in unity that there are many paths to the mountaintop. And I think perhaps the Hindu tradition in yoga does a really good job of describing some of the different paths to that mountaintop. They talk about Jnana Yoga, which is the path for the mind or the intellect that emphasizes knowledge and wisdom. Then they talk about Bhakti Yoga, which is the path for the heart that emphasizes love and compassion and devotion to God. They talk about karma yoga, which is the path of action that is all about selfless service and doing good unto others. Most people are probably familiar with hatha yoga, which is the physical path that emphasizes postures and breathing. Then there is raja yoga, the royal path, which has to do with meditation and contemplation, introspection. I would like to suggest another path, the path of beauty, which is all about mindfulness of beauty and appreciation for it. So <clears throat> further scriptural sources are, I'm going to take mainly from the Psalms, because David was a great appreciator of beauty. And he describes it's almost like a cycle. First there is an apprehension of beauty, and then an appreciation of it. So <clears throat> the initial uh, quote, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness is so important, it's found three different times in the Hebrew scriptures. It's found in First Chronicles, and then it's found in two different places in the Psalms. David also says, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Amen to that. And out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. Now, Charles Fillmore, one of the co-founders of Unity, has said that metaphysically interpreted, Zion stands for spiritual consciousness. So out of our own spiritual consciousness, beauty and divinity shine. David also says, honor and majesty are before God. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. And again, sanctuary doesn't have to be a church or a temple. It can also be our own consciousness. One thing have I desired of the Lord, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. And then, as appreciation for all of this beauty, David says things like, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God and there is none else. Now, those are kind of uh, archaic King James terminology, which is what I grew up with. And some of that, um, it almost sounds like I'm praying to something outside of me, which I don't like, um, since the divine consciousness is everywhere present within and without. So sometimes I will substitute I am in those quotations in the sense of the Moses, I am that I am, or the passage that says, be still and know that I am. And uh, Myrtle Fillmore, the other Unity co-founder, liked to use the phrase, the Christ I am. So if I substitute I am, I get things like, great is I am, and greatly to be praised. 
4. From everlasting to everlasting, I am is God, and there is no other. Which sometimes works better for me. And in Zechariah, we read, How great is God's goodness, how great is God's beauty. And there we get the connection between goodness and beauty that was so important to the ancient Greeks. And so, for my next source on beauty, I'm going to go to the ancient Greeks, and I'm going to go to Plato. And he's not usually thought of as a religious writer, because he never explicitly mentions God or divinity. But when he talks about beauty with a capital B, or when he talks about eternal oneness, I think he's talking about God. Plato talks about a ladder of beauty that leads up to divinity, starting at the lowest level and then advancing upward to the divine presence. And this is how he describes it. This is the way, the only way he must approach, starting from individual beauties, the quest for universal beauty must find him ever mounting the heavenly ladder, stepping from rung to rung. That is, from bodily beauty to the beauty of institutions, from institutions to learning, and from learning in general to that special lore that pertains to nothing but the beautiful itself, until at last he comes to know what beauty is. So I think most of us don't have any problem appreciating beauty at the physical level, sunsets, flowers. But some people aren't so, aren't so comfortable stepping up to the next rung of the ladder and saying beauty can describe things like certain things in human society, like the pursuit of justice or the way to share compassion. And he goes on to say, and even higher than that is learning. So could we say that learning is beautiful and then perhaps ignorance would be ugly? And finally he goes on, the most important type of learning is learning about beauty or divinity. What is it like to achieve that final goal to arrive at the top of the ladder? This is how Plato describes it. Whoever has viewed all these aspects of the beautiful in due succession is at last drawing near the final revelation. The universal beauty dawns upon his inward sight. There bursts upon him that wondrous vision, which is the very soul of the beauty he has toiled so long for. It is an everlasting loveliness which neither comes nor goes which neither flowers nor fades, for it subsists of itself and by itself in eternal oneness. And if man's life is ever worth the living, it is when he has attained this vision of the very soul of beauty. Wow. So his description of that latter is kind of basic. So I want to turn to another writer who has described that ladder in greater detail. And that would be Plotinus, who is considered the last great philosopher of antiquity before the coming of the Dark Ages to Europe and the Mediterranean. Uh, he lived in Alexandria, Egypt, which was the center of learning at that time and had the world's largest library. And he's generally acknowledged as being, of all philosophers, one of the greatest experts in beauty. So this is what he has to say and how he begins to describe his version of the ladder of beauty leading up to the divine. Beauty addresses itself chiefly to sight, but there is a beauty for hearing too, as in certain combinations of words and in all kinds of music. For melodies and cadences are beautiful, 
and minds that lift themselves above the realm of sense to a higher order are aware of beauty in the conduct of life, in actions, in character, in the pursuits of the intellect, and there is the beauty of the virtues. What loftier beauty there may be yet, our argument will bring to light. So again, he starts in the realm of the senses, but then he says there can be beauty in actions in conduct. So could we say that certain actions are beautiful and others are ugly? Could we say that acts of compassion and generosity would be beautiful and acts of cruelty could be considered ugly? Then he talks about beauty of character and virtues. Could we consider courage or honesty to be beautiful and then might cowardice and deceit be ugly? He goes on to say, in describing beauty of the, at the higher end of the ladder, thus far the beauties of the realm of sense, but there are earlier and loftier beauties than these. In the sense-bound life, we are no longer granted to know them, but the soul taking no help from the organs, sees and proclaims them. To the vision of these we must mount, leaving sense to its own low place. As it is not to speak of the graceful forms of the material world for those who have never seen them or known their grace, been born blind, let us suppose, in the same way those must be silent upon the beauty of noble conduct and of learning have never cared for such things. Nor may those tell of the splendor of virtue who have never known the face of justice and of moral wisdom, beautiful beyond the beauty of evening and dawn. So he's suggesting that noble conduct and learning are beautiful, that justice is more beautiful than the dawn, and morality is more beautiful sunset. And he goes on to say, such vision is for those only who see with the soul's sight, and at the vision they will rejoice, and awe will fall upon them, and a trouble deeper than all the rest could ever stir, for now they are moving in the realm of truth. There is the spirit of beauty that must induce wonderment and a delicious trouble, longing and a trembling that is all the light. So almost all the readers that talk about this sense of beauty talk about being overcome with awe or wonder. And I often think that maybe in today's fast-paced technological society, there's not a lot of space for awe and wonder. And I think awe can be inspirational and cleansing. A couple of years ago, Pixar, the animated movie studio, came out with a movie called Inside Out. Did anybody see that movie? Quite a few people. Uh, the protagonist is a young girl whose family moves and she undergoes some turbulence. But the genius of the movie is that it tries to show the inside of human consciousness and how it works. And there's a control panel and different emotions take turns running the control panel. And there's joy, sadness, fear, anger, and envy. And as they take over the panel, there are various results, some of which are quite humorous. I heard an interview with the director where he was talking about which emotions they wanted to pick to use in the movie. And one of the emotions that they considered but didn't use was awe. And I think they didn't use awe because awe is kind of a showstopper. It takes time. It's not gonna to add to the rapid advancement of the plot or the storyline. But we can take time for our awe in our lives if we choose to. Um, and we can find beauty wherever we look. It's kind of, you see what you look for. There's the old saying, when a pickpocket looks at a 
saint. The pickpocket sees only the saint's pockets, which is hardly the most salient feature to be observed. Um, another movie reference uh, decades ago, uh, there was a movie, American Beauty, and there's a character in that movie who's a young man who wants to be a cinematographer, and he takes videos of many different things where he finds beauty. And one of them is a piece of paper trash blowing in the wind. And most people might just say, oh, it's a piece of trash. But there was something about how the wind was carrying it that he found to be very beautiful and moving. So I think most people uh, can find beauty in nature and being alone in nature, flowers, uh, looking at the sky. Uh, so I wanted to uh, read a passage about beauty in nature. And this is from Eckhart Tolle. And he is like David. He has the apprehension of the beauty and then the appreciation for it. It's that same kind of cycle. So the basic idea here is that what nature can give us is stillness. And what we can give nature is appreciation. So this is how he describes it. We need nature to show us the way home. We have forgotten what rocks and flowers and animals still know. How to be, to be still, to be one with the totality of life here and now. Allow a flower to teach you its secrets. The moment you become aware of a plant's emanation of stillness and peace, the plant becomes your teacher. Something of its essence transmits itself to you. The same stillness arises within you. It is a harmony, a sacredness that permeates the whole of nature. You need nature as your teacher, but it also needs you. The tree, the flower, the bird, the rock are unaware of their own beauty and sacredness. When you recognize the sacredness and beauty in which a flower or tree exists, you pass something to the flower or the tree through your recognition. Through your awareness, nature too comes to know itself. It comes to know its own beauty and sacredness through you. Nature can bring you to stillness and that is its gift to you. Through, through you, nature becomes aware of its own beauty and sacredness. That is your gift to nature. Nature has been waiting for you for millions of years. That passage emphasizes beauty on the outside, but I think we all know that the universal beauty exists both within and without. Uh, another passage about beauty comes from the Bhagavad Gita, when Arjuna has his mind-expanding experience, and how he's, this is one of the ways he describes it. I see the splendor of an infinite beauty which illumines the whole universe illumines everything within and without, and it is splendid. So what about the inner beauty, the ultimate source? How do we access it? And here again, I go back to Plotinus, who describes an inward path. But what must we do? How lies the path? How come to vision of the inaccessible beauty, dwelling as if in consecrated precincts, apart from the common way where all may see, even the profane? He that has the strength, let him arise and withdraw into himself. He must close the eyes and call instead another vision 
which is to be walked within you, a vision, the birthright of all, which few turn to use. To attain it is for those that will take the upward path, who will set all their forces toward it. Still the untamed body, purify your soul from earthly things. The inner eye will begin to exercise its clear and solemn vision. This region of truth is within us. The wise man withdraws into the holy place of his own soul. All that tends to purify and elevate the mind will assist you in this attainment. And one that shall know this vision, this very beauty, he will be flooded with awness and glad. The man is changed no longer himself. For on this higher plane, things that touch it all are one. On that higher plane, things that touch it all are one. And in closing, I will say that just reminds me of the passage in the Gospels where the woman who wants to cure for the issue of blood wants to come to Jesus for a cure, and she says, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be cured. It's just touching it. And she does touch it, and she is cured instantaneously. And that reminds me of this, at that higher level, things that touch at all are one. And so it is.